intellectual self-discovery. You're listening to another episode of the In the Driveway podcast. Intellectual yet stimulating. All the topics you're not supposed to talk about at the dinner table. Politics, economics, religion. You know happen under the stars with your bros. So crack open a cold one. Blaze up if you've got one. And join your hosts, Chad and Dustin, in the driveway. What's up, motherfuckers? We're back in the driveway. I'm here with Chad. What is up? And I am Dustin. Today, we have got a great show for you, uh, I hope. Um, Chad is going to attempt to explain to us why we do, in fact, have free will. Right. Um, you know, I would, I would frame it differently. I'm not trying to prove that we do have free will because I'm not quite sure that that's a possibility. But I am going to disprove, hopefully, arguments that say that we definitely don't have free will. Well, shit. Go ahead and hit me with it. All right. Um, Well, so the first thing that I think should be acknowledged with regard to free will is that the proof for free will is sort of like the proof for the existence of consciousness. We don't really have any physical proof of consciousness. It's not like we've, you know, uh, cut open some people's brains and found consciousness existing within. And it's not like just by people telling us that they're conscious, that that's proof that consciousness exists. Each of us has proof of consciousness just from the phenomenal, phenomenological um, givenness of consciousness of being a conscious being we know that consciousness exists the the existence of free will is similar of being a conscious being uh, capable of making choices being a being that makes choices we at least have the suspicion that free will exists now that creates the grounding of of the you know why we should think that we perhaps do have free will is because we have the experience of having free will. Um, does that make sense so far? Uh, all right. Um, it makes sense, but I'm not sure if it yeah, makes enough sense. Oh, right. Yeah. That's, I mean, this is just, it's the, a, I, this is just I, the groundwork. That it's on its own is not, uh, not really evidence of much. No, I mean, it's evidence for me um, and, and you alone and, and, and me in my personal experience. But right. outside of that. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's that's I mean, I think that's as far as proof can come, because in my uh, metaphysical idea of of free will is that it's actually uh, it's uh, it's it's a priori it's prior to all experiences it is like at a fundamental part of what we are such that we can't get behind it and deduce it from anything else so there's no way we're ever going to create an argument that's like therefore free will exists it's more like we start with free will and then we have to somehow justify it post hoc but uh, anyway, so that's the that's the beginning, and uh, the way I wrote it here is our, our direct experiences, our, our direct experiences that we make self determined autonomous choices all the time. So that provides the groundwork for why we might begin with the assumption that perhaps we do have the ability to make free will choices. Now I would like to make a distinction here. There's two different. Uh, conceptualizations of free will some people think of free will as um the freedom from constraint like uh if 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 uh, if you don't have the ability to do whatever you want then you don't have free will but i am talking about free will in a very specific sense which is that if you have any array of potential choices and you have the freedom to choose between those then you have free will even if those are very small um so like right now we don't have the choice to fly or walk through walls or anything like that so those choices are not available to us but we do have the choice of whether or not to pick our nose and 
stand up or sit down, those types of things. So basically so we, you're saying we have the free will to choose anything within our ability to choose. Correct. Yeah. So that is what I'm arguing for that type of free will, not the type of free will that's we have the ability to do whatever we want at any time. And none of our choices are constrained. Okay. So um, obviously we've gone, we're going to have to, when we're talking about free will and whether or not we have it, the way that people commonly say that free will has been disproven is through the Libet experiments. And this is something that, um, uh, what's his name? The, uh, the moral landscape guy, Sam Harris, Sam Harris. Yeah. Yeah. He cited in his book, uh, waking up these experiments that seem to indicate that we do not have free will because our brain has made the choice to do something before we are conscious of actually having chosen it. And the uh, Libet experiments uh, prove this um, by, let's see here, it says, uh, make, uh, make a spontaneous movement without pre-planning in any way is the, uh, is, is the instruction that is given to, to the uh, experimentee. So they hook you up with a uh, EEG scanner on your brain, and then they hook up your arm to an EMG um, uh, machine that you know monitors your brain activity, and then the other thing monitors your muscle activity in your hand. And then you're supposed to look at this clock that's in front of you, and it's constantly sp spinning around in circles. And then you're supposed to make a completely spontaneous movement with your hand, a choice of when you're going to move the, the hand. And then you're supposed to tell them at what point you made the choice on the clock. So you could be like, I move the hand. And then like, I'm conscious that I was going to do it at when it said 35. And then they will look at your brain. And what they'll see is that your brain started getting ready to move like 10 milliseconds before you were conscious of even choosing to uh to to make that movement at that time does it does that is that a good explanation dustin yeah and this is called the preparedness response right right or the the readiness potential i mean the readiness potential yeah yeah um so yeah the readiness potential is a, a gradual buildup of neuronal activity that reliably precedes subjectively spontaneous voluntary movements presumed to reflect the pre-conscious initiation of movement so, uh, yeah, so there's, uh, you can see on a chart that um, the uh, fluctuations in the brain activity, um, yeah, they start ramping up like 200 milliseconds before the subject actually becomes aware of the decision to press the button. And then actually uh, up to 10 seconds prior. Yeah, up, up to 10 seconds. Wow. Yeah, that's a really long time it is um yeah so so they're saying that you know your conscious awareness to choose is a sort of illusion because it was happening there's a series of events like dominoes falling that are in progress well before the point where you decide to choose okay um so, so now to I'm not proving that free will exists in this, in this, uh, this argument here. I'm just debunking this claim that this disproves that free will exists. So, so it's not, it's not like I'm saying if I disprove this claim, then free will exists. If I disprove this claim, I'm just saying then this claim doesn't disprove the possibility of free will. Is that, is that fair? That's fair. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so what is not talked about a lot when people are discussing the Libet experiments is that um, there is also evidence of times when the readiness potential is present and the person decides not to press the button. Um, right. The veto interpretation. Yeah. The veto response. Right. 
Right. Um, so this is, uh, or the freedom to abort. The decision to disinhibit the ballistic movement cascade or to inhibit veto the movement occurs at uh, 150 to 200 milliseconds, the time at which the subjects report the urge to move. So um, what happens is that, you know, the buildup starts happening and then around 200 milliseconds, they feel the urge to move. And then at that moment, they either move or do not. Now, if they do move, they people interpret it as meaning that that buildup was the decision to move happening way before they actually consciously chose. But if they do not move, then that buildup is is uh, just discounted, and it's and it's not usually included in the Libet experimental experimental data. They just they just dismiss those times, but it seems to sh to well, it seems to show that the decision actually happens at the two hundred millisecond mark, whether or not to move, even though the urge comes from from before. Right, but the veto uh, interpretation only it doesn't apply if you don't have enough time to change your mind. It, you you have to have enough time to be able to make that veto to make that switch. If you've already too far into the action to where you can't stop it, then, you know, so on, on more split second responses, it, the veto interpretation doesn't completely hold up. Mm, okay. Well, I mean, luckily that's not the, the core of my argument here, but that was just something I wanted to bring up. Right, right. Okay. So moving forward. So the questions that uh, that that we um, that we ask when when presented with all of this this information is that uh, the the data in a time locked the data that's time locked to movement excludes buildup that don't result in movement. So the um, like I was saying, the they they present the data in these experiments that results in movement. And then that shows what happened in that scenario, but they don't present all the other data that shows similar buildups that never resulted in any movement, which is, you know, it's, it's uh, something to question. Next um, perceptual decision-making and reaction times don't take one to two seconds. Why does spontaneous movement have a one to two second buildup? That's a question because if it takes one to two seconds to decide to do something, then I think, you know, watching basketball games and football games and, and, uh, you know, ping pong matches and stuff like that would be a lot different than what we actually see. It doesn't actually take us one to two seconds to build up the decision to make any movements or else we're able to, or our brains are predicting what's going to happen before it actually happens and you know time traveling essentially to to let us know what to do before it happens because one to two seconds is a really long time in a lot of different areas like like driving your car sometimes things happen you have to make a split second decision if it took your brain one right. to two seconds to build up the the uh action to do that then you would just be dead well a lot of times like playing tennis the person who just hit the ball will already start anticipating the way it will be returned and moving as soon as they hit it before it ever even reaches the other side of the court. So yeah, but it's we not, they're not, it's not really split second decision well, making. I mean, these are, they, these are experimentally verified. So they usually have these things where you're standing in front of this big screen and then the dots will pop up on the screen in, in random areas. And you're supposed to, as fast as you can, uh, uh, touch those dots as, uh, as they pop up. And people are able to hit all the dots right after they pop up within like half of a second consistently. It, it never takes the full one to two seconds that the uh, readiness potential takes. So it's suggesting that we're, we're th this type of decision making doesn't, require that that build up the same way that there's they're interpreting this data to say that spontaneous movements require this build up 
And the question is, if it is the case that spontaneous movement requires this long buildup, why, why is that the case? Which I'm going to give a pretty interesting answer to in a minute, but that's the question. Okay. Okay. All right. And then uh, the next thing is uh, the data is not useful for making categorical predictions, but only probabilistic forecasts. So it's not the case that you can look at a brain scan of someone and then just keep an eye out for any readiness potential buildups and then reliably predict that they're about to make a movement. It's it just doesn't give you that sort of information because you still don't know if they're going to veto or not. So even if you see a readiness potential building up, you have no extra information about whether or not they're about to make a movement or not, which seems to suggest that this isn't showing us exactly what we are being told that it's showing us. Does that make All sense? Right. All right. Okay. So what is it showing us? Okay. Moving on. So the interesting thing <clears throat> is that um, the directions in the Libet experiments is to be spontaneous. Don't pre-plan when you're going to move. Just randomly, bam, you're going to move without making the decision. Now, when you get the directions to be totally random, to be spontaneous, how do you actually accomplish that? How do, how do you be spontaneous? Well, there is a model that, that uh, describes this called the random walk decision model. That there is a, uh, a threshold that we place in our mind for a nor uh, applied to a neural accumulator. So basically, we are we when we are told to be spontaneous, we are monitoring our own brain waves. We're monitoring that urge to move and letting it waver up and down. It's going up and down. I don't know. Do I want to move? Nah, no, nah, I'm not. You yeah, maybe no. Nah, may. And then if it gets to a certain threshold, like yeah, I think I'm okay. Move. That's when we decide to move. Now, those random fluctuations in neural activity influence when the decision threshold is reached. And the 150 to 200 millisecond before movement onset, we make the neuronal commitment to move. So we're actually making the choice at that 200 millisecond mark. We're not making the choice at the one to two seconds prior when the buildup happens. So we're allowing the buildup to go up and up and up. And then we're choosing maybe, maybe not. But every time we say yes, you'll see that there was a buildup to it just because that's how the decision is being made based on buildup or not of that urge to move. So if you look at all the data, you'll see that every single time the decision was made, there was a buildup. But that doesn't make the, mean that the brain had already previously decided to move before we actually were conscious of the choice does that is this making sense now okay yeah okay and um so so this is also called the stochastic decision model stochastic just means random um so the neural decision is a commitment to a particular response that corresponds to the crossing of a threshold. So when the instructor says, okay, make a totally random spontaneous movement, don't pre-plan it. We say, okay. And then we decide in our mind, we're gonna try to be random and we're just gonna fluctuate our the urge to move and just do what's random. So we're deciding already prior how we're gonna do this. And then the decision-making tasks are typically modeled in terms of an accumulation of evidence Spontaneous movement is specifically based not on evidence, but just on something random. So the, the same accumulator plus threshold mechanism that models reaction times and perception, perception decisions are fed solely with internal physiological noise. So instead of allowing us to build up evidence for something in our brain, we're building up uh, the internal physiological urge to move. And that's when we make the decision instead of, you know, building up a, a threshold of evidence to decide if, if we're going to do something or not. Um, 
So they've actually modeled this um, in simulations. Um, it's called the SDM simulation data. And uh, the SDM perfectly replicates the readiness potential, providing an alternative to the pre-conscious initiation of movement interpretation. So um, in, in the model, um, it basically, uh, they simulated, uh, you know, the random fluctuations of physiological noise. And then they said, you know, if it reaches this threshold, then we will decide, it, it will decide to choose to move. And every time it reaches that threshold, if you time lock that data and take a picture of it, it looks like there was this pre-conscious buildup to the movement, just exactly like the Libet experiments show. So there, th whether or not this is the correct interpretation of the, of the data or the Libet interpretation is better, we don't know because they give the exact same data. It looks exactly the same either way. So, you know, it could be one or the other. Um, so the question of whether or not we have free will boils down to the question of is forming an intention to move at a threshold the free will choice when we're giving the instructions and is an aborted movement after the buildup happens is that a free will choice to, to do the veto and if the ready readiness potential represents ongoing spontaneous fluctuations in neural activity and our intention is to decide to act at a threshold well, then it seems like conscious free will choice is preserved despite the Libet experiments. Okay. Now, I do, I do want to conclude with a certain um, thing to wrap it up. So um, I, I think a lot of people, including Sam Harris, are very confident in their conclusion that we don't have free will because they are very confident and their assumption that the universe is the Newtonian classical physics material universe. Like the, the fundamental thing is material objects. And if that's the case, then you're going to have determinism, which means that everything that happens is, is the result of previous actions and interactions of material objects, such that uh, if you had the um, Laplace demon that knew the movements of every particle in the universe, then you could predict the future forever because everything that happens is just a result of these interactions of particles. And it's just like a domino set falling down. So it's a deterministic response. And, you know, if you think that consciousness and free will, the illusion of such are um, just the result of material interactions then it's just not logically it's it's logically incompatible to say that we do have free will choice so that that is the underlying metaphysical assumption that i think gives people the confidence to say that there is no way we have free will we may feel like we do it may seem like we do but we just don't because it's a logically inconsistent with their metaphysical view um, but you know, my, my idea is that matter is not what is fundamentally real. Consciousness is what is fundamentally real. And if consciousness has free will, then it's fundamental to what exists for us to be able to make free choices. So the question I usually end with is, are we collections of material objects hallucinating the existence of our consciousness and free will, or are we consciousnesses with free will? hallucinating the existence of an objective material universe. Thank you very much. Wow. Uh, very well put together. Um, thank you for that. Um, I know I'm going to add on because uh, I, I agree with most of that. Uh, some of it not. Now, I will say that the uh, determinist in, in, in interpretations of the libet experiments um, fall short when considering the veto interpretation. However, the veto interpretation has limits. If the time uh, to react is is too quick, 
then you've already started the movement and there's not enough time to veto it, then there's a loss of free will there. But if you have time to veto that movement, you certainly can, which I would agree suggests free will. Um, in 2018, some more studies were done into the Libet experiments. Um, and then we we got the deliberate versus arbitrary choice choice interpretation. Basically, um, people there are two different processes for making decisions. That was loud. Um, so there were two different. Did you hear that on your end, or was that just me? I think that was just you. What, what was it? Oh, cool. All right, it was in my ear. It was, uh, Norton antivirus thing popping up. Oh, no, I didn't hear it. Yeah, okay, cool. All right. Um, so basically, there are two different processes. Um, there's the arbitrary choice or spontaneous, uh, or not spontaneous, but the arbitrary, well, I guess spontaneous would be arbitrary, um, but the arbitrary choice response or the readiness response um, suggests that when people are making decisions that don't really matter or affect their life any, that they tend to just run autonomously into those choices. Um, but whenever decisions are more deliberate, there's a completely separate process that happens in the brain for those deliberate choices, um, say deciding whether to put money in the bank or whatever the choice may be. Um, in those more deliberate choices where people have more time to consider their options of action, we see more free will, uh, or so we think free will from those. Um, the problem is what's behind those things. Um, and I think that this is where neuroscience starts to not be able to answer the questions. I think your entire interpretation stems from an, an assumption that, um, that there are no constraints at some point. But my argument is there are always constraints. There can um, never be a point where there is not constraint. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there are always constraints. Okay. I would, so I would not be assuming that there's no constraints ever. Oh, okay. Well, you're, 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 you said at the beginning, we're assuming that under a circumstance where there's no constraints, we're not talking about walking through walls or whatever. Yeah. But uh, I think that there's always a constraint on what we're capable of. And yeah. I, uh, one of the ways that Sam Harris explains this in one of his um, examples is pick a city, any city in the world, right? Okay. Oh, all right. What city did you pick? Phoenix. You're wrong. <laughs> so, okay. You picked Phoenix. All right. Um, the problem with that is, is at any point in time while making that decision, did Mumbai cross your mind? No. No. How can you be free to choose something that would never occur to you? If well, I have no knowledge of something, yeah. how could I freely choose it? Well, that's what I'm saying is we there are constraints. So there's only a certain number of cities that I'm aware of. And so I only have the free will to choose between the ones that I'm aware of choosing. I don't have the free will to choose the ones I'm not aware of or that don't occur to me. But that doesn't mean we don't have free will. That just means that my free will choices are constrained to the number of cities that I have in my memory bank. Okay. But not only that is what made you want to choose that? Is there something in your history that has put that into your brain? Is there 
something that happened recently that was making you think about Phoenix that you don't even remember thinking no. about? Yeah, I mean, the reason why there are reasons why it's in my memory bank and that it's more fresh in my memory bank than other cities. Um, but it still remains the case. I, I feel like the, the question we need to ask here is that among all of the cities that are I'm aware of that are in my memory at the moment, am I able to make a free will choice between those? Despite the reasons why that they may be in my memory at the moment, am I able to choose between maybe the five or six that I had pulled up in my brain? Say I, I had a, you know, five, five different cities I was thinking about. Was I able to make a free will choice deciding which one? Right. But you're not able to make the free will choice to choose one that's not in your brain. Right. So correct. Okay. Yeah. But that's not, yeah, that doesn't mean I don't have the free will to choose between the ones I do. Right. Okay. Sure. Um, but the ones that you have in your brain were in your brain because of some instance, circumstance or stimuli outside of your brain yeah okay your brain is materials it's electrons flowing uh, and uh, uh, allegedly i mean they now in, in physics they they uh have figured out that electrons aren't material objects there are points with the properties of mass and charge it, like the mathematics doesn't work if you decide that it's an actual material object you have to consider it as like a a point like a a, a vector on a graph rather than an actual object so it's 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 more well, complicated than just saying it's a material object let's talk about once let's talk about once if i want to go put my money in the bank why do i want it Do um, I have do I have the choice to choose not to want it? Yeah. How? Like, if I don't even know what the reason is that I wanted it in the first place, it would be a causal relationship to whatever made me want it. And I'm I'm not in control of that. That's a that's another thing that has influenced my decision. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's lots like, of things that can influence. Like, even if I wanted to be a Christian, or like I don't want to be a Christian, but I can't make myself want to be. I just I want the things I want, and I I can't make myself not want those things, or I can't uh, make myself want something that I know I don't want. Well, I mean, that's an interesting thing because I think that want is derived from values and values are derived from choices. And there, it, it, what complicates this discussion the, is that choice, that uh, values have a uh, different levels of um, importance. So your highest level value determines your secondary level values to a certain extent. So a lot of times what happens is your lower level value system, it seems to you that you don't have any control over that just because you have this highest level value that you're not even considering changing that determines your lower level value system. Okay. And that's not a thing I'm in control of. No, you are. You are in control of your highest level value. It's uh. Well, no, because uh, I I came by that value for because what my dad held that value, or because the people around me have told me that I should hold that value, or no. But I mean, like, if you even take your specific situation, your dad is a Christian, right? Yeah, and your dad wanted you to be a Christian, right? Sure, and yet you chose a different path in life you decided to rebel no, but, against no but i didn't choose it 
I didn't choose it. I lack the ability to want to be a Christian. I lack the ability to believe in all of that. As hard as I try, I could want to believe all of that, but it'll never happen. It would never occur to well, me. It's like you want that. Do I have the ability to believe that two plus two equals five? I would say no, I don't have the ability to believe that, even if I really wanted to believe it, right. because I know the logic of quantity means that two plus two equals four. Okay. And which, I which, can't change uh, that. Exactly. So to 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 say that um to say anything opposite of that would be an argument from ignorance the only reason that you want this thing is because you're ignorant of the thing that would change your mind on that yeah but i mean i feel like choices like in in, in the whether or not christianity is true there's a certain logic that results in the conclusion either this is true or this is false in the same way that two plus two equals five and we don't have control over the logic of whether or not it's true but in the main place that i think choices arise is like you have to choose whether or not this person in my life is someone i should marry or well, you have to make a choice of should i have you, children or what not? do you make that choice based on that I mean, you don't have enough information to know whether that's the right choice or not. So it's a free will choice of no, that's 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 a that's an argument from ignorance. What do you mean? Well, you don't have the ability to choose that because you don't know why you're choosing it. I mean, I don't think you have to know. I mean, if if you have well, if you have an option of A or B, right? Well, if I had a bad experience in my past where uh, I got sick off of French toast, do I have the choice to start liking French toast again, even though it has repulsed me in the past? It was that repulsion that caused my decision not to get French toast in the morning. Yeah, I mean, it, I wouldn't say caused, I would say influenced because you could choose to go on a, a, a program of uh, uh, intentional exposure to try to reacquaint yourself with French toast in a way that you start to like it again. Or you could choose not to attempt that at all and to just give in to that influence and never again go anywhere near any french toast but you still have the choice of where your actions are going to go even though you now have this influence well i don't i don't i think okay so um if hold on what am i wanting to say here um I don't know. It left my head while I was waiting for you to finish talking. Yeah. Huh. But well, anyways, uh, I think a good episode, eh? Yeah, I think this is a good place to leave it. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing all of that. Uh, all right. Anyways, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, click like, subscribe, share, comment, ring bells, all the stuff. Go to our website. Check out our merchandise. Buy a hoodie. Help us out. Donate something. All right. We'll see you all next time. Peace. If you've gotten something of significant value from what you just heard, please consider supporting the show by visiting our Patreon page or copying some sweet merch at our website, inthedrivewaypodcast.com. Thank you for listening. And remember, love really is the answer.